You know, to me, this picture right here defines the last 18 months. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but the most frustrating part about these past 18 months to me has just been the uncertainty of almost everything. Uh, just constantly, guidelines and policies constantly changing week to week. You know, you, you know there are some long-range plans you need to be making, but you're not sure if you should invest the, the time and, in some cases, the money in that because you don't know if it, it's, you're even going to be able to carry it out or not. You know, graduations, proms, weddings, vacations, mission trips, group trips, sports, all these things are constantly up in the air right now. You just can't be sure of a whole lot of things at this point. And to me, that it really rem I really thought about that over this past week, if you were keeping up with your Core 52 reading, for what our topic was over this past week and, and the scriptures that, that you read as part of that reading. And we're going to talk about a lot of those scriptures today as well. But basically, what you were reading there in Core 52, the, the idea centers around, I think, two main questions that I want us to think about today. Can a Christian be certain of their salvation? And can a Christian lose their salvation? You know, this topic, uh, some people call it eternal security. Some say assurance of salvation. Some use the phrase once saved, always saved. But this is a topic that has led to a lot of you know, heated debates uh, amongst Christians for centuries. You know, there have been uh, disagreements, strong disagreements about this. There have been divisions, church splits that have resulted uh, from, from different, uh, differences of uh, positions on this. And it is a confusing topic because it appears that Scripture gives us contradictory answers to these two questions. But it's worth the effort of, of wrestling with these things, of, of thinking about these things, because the answers to these questions, you know, you think about it, this whole idea, maybe it seems like something, well, that's just something scholars debate that biblical scholars talk about, and they spend all their days in the classroom talking about that, but this doesn't really have much impact on my life. Well, I think as we'll see today, it has tremendous impact on our lives, tremendous impact on our faith in God and the trust that we have in God and just practical day-to-day -day living as a Christian. I know we probably have, with a group this size, many Christians here this morning who have different positions on this, probably passionate positions on this. So as we, as we begin to talk about this topic today, I just want to encourage you with this. Let's just let Scripture speak for itself. Let Scripture speak for itself. Let's just wrestle with what Scripture says and not wrestle with each other about this. All right? let, let, let's not get in fights with each other about this. Let's be sure that we embrace both the promises that we find in Scripture and the warnings that we find in Scripture as they relate to these important questions. So as we begin, the, the first essential truth I think we've really got to grab hold of and understand as we begin to think about these questions is that we are saved by the undeserved and unearned grace of God given through His Son Jesus, period. Period. That's what we call biblical grace. We are saved by the grace of God and that grace came through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not by following rules. It's not about by knowing a bunch of stuff or being generous or charitable or whatever else. None of those things can save us or anybody else. In writing to the Christians in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul drove this truth home. And like I said, this is the first of a lot of scriptures we're going to be looking at today. So it's going to be scripture heavy today. Uh, just know that going into it. But Paul said this, he said, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace 
that you have been saved. God saved you by His grace through your faith in Christ Jesus. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So no one can boast about it. For we are God's handiwork. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Y'all, that is the main reason we can have confidence in our salvation. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on us. Thank God, right? It doesn't depend on us. It, is, it totally rests in the perfection and the righteousness of what Jesus accomplished for those who place their faith in Him. Jesus Himself assured us of the certainty of what He accomplished for His followers. Look at what He said. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And over in John chapter 10, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and He is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. You know, that, those words, what we just read there from Scripture, what Jesus Himself said, that should give us, as Christians, if you're a Christian sitting here today, that should give us so much encouragement and joy and peace and hope and certainty. And certainty. We should never, ever doubt what Jesus has accomplished for us. Jesus fights for us. Amen? Paul reemphasized Jesus' words in his letter to the Christians in Rome. I love this verse. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow... No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a truth that should give us all the hope that we need to get through any trial in this life. Any trial in this life. We have a guarantee we have a guarantee of what Jesus accomplished for His followers and what He is preparing for us in eternity. A guarantee of that. Can you be sure of your salvation? As a faithful follower of Jesus, you should answer yes. Yes, you can. Your answer doesn't need to be maybe, or I don't know, or I'm not sure. I, I, I just, I, I don't know. It doesn't need to be that. Your answer can and should be yes. Answering yes to this question is the natural result of a proper understanding of grace and a proper understanding of what Jesus has accomplished for those who have placed their faith in Him. Now, having said that, we also find Many passages in Scripture that warn Christians, don't let go of Jesus. Don't let go of Him. And that there are eternal consequences for doing so. Uh, the most gripping explanation of this is found in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The writer says, It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, 
since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Jesus said this, If anyone does not abide in me, in order to abide with Jesus, we have to have already been with Jesus. We are already in Him. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. He also said this, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. There's lots of other passages like this that that communicate this same idea. So what we're left with is there are two sides to this. There, There is a tension here. We are secure in Christ. But the warning is that we can, in fact, abandon Jesus even after we've placed our faith in Him. J.D. Greer, I know many of you might know him. He's a preacher in the Raleigh area. But he tells an interesting story about a guy that he witnessed to while playing a game of pickup basketball one day. It's a park that he often went to and saw this guy regularly there. So he tells this story. I want to share it with you. He said, one afternoon, I was at a local basketball court and picked up a game of 21 with a guy who I'd seen there many times before. He was quite a character. He had so many tattoos on his body, I wasn't sure what the actual color of his skin was. <laughs> and so many piercings, he looked like he'd fallen headfirst into a tackle box. He, he cursed like a sailor, and he always bragged about the girls he was with. So not necessarily the kind of guy you hope your daughter brings home one day. Well, as we played our game, I began to share my story of how I came to Christ. About three sentences in, he stopped, grabbed the ball, and said, Dude, are you trying to witness to me? I said, uh, yeah. (laughs) And he said, well, that's pretty cool. Nobody's tried to witness to me in uh, a really long time. But I got to tell you, man, you're wasting your time. He said this. He said, you see, I grew up in church. I went to youth camp. Every year when I was 13, I placed my trust in Christ. I was baptized. And for the next couple years, you know, I was a super Christian. I mean it. I went to youth group every week. I did the True Love Waits commitment. Um, I memorized verses, went on mission trips. I even led some of my other friends to belief in Jesus as well. But about two years after that, I decided, you know, I don't believe it is a sin to have premarital sex. One thing led to another. A couple years after that, I didn't believe in God anymore. So now I don't go to church, I don't pray, and I pretty much do whatever I want. He he continues, he says, but dude, here's the awesome part. The church I grew up in taught once saved, always saved. That means my salvation at age 13 still holds, even if I don't believe in God anymore. So even if you're right, and God exists, and Jesus is the only way, I'm good. I'm safe. Either way, it works out great for me. Okay, you're shot. (laughs) So, is that guy still going to heaven? Because at age 13, when he was a teenager, he made an initial decision to place his trust in Jesus. He was baptized into Christ. He was served him for faithfully for a number of years, was kind of on fire about it. Some will say that guy was never saved in the first place. And that's why he was able to abandon Jesus so easily. But here's the thing. We can't know that. We can't know that. You and I can't see into an individual's heart and know the sincerity of the decision they're making when they place that initial trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. What we can know for sure is that some passages of Scripture clearly teach we are secure in Jesus. And other passages of Scripture clearly teach that we can abandon Jesus. So, can we hold these two seemingly contrary positions at the same time? I believe we can. And I believe we should. Christians are eternally secure in Jesus. But we also have some responsibility in following Him.
that can impact eternity. Here are some passages I think help us understand this tension between these two things. This is from James, the brother of Jesus. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. And Jesus said this Himself, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, I mentioned this earlier. Some Christians use the phrase, once saved, always saved. And based on some passages of Scripture we've looked at this morning, you could say there is truth in that. But I think maybe a better way to phrase it is, once saved, follow faithfully. Once saved, follow faithfully. The faith that saves is the faith that perseveres to the end. Now I know that that raises some questions about, well, what happens if I sin after I become a Christian? Am I lost if I sin? What if somebody's faith cools off for a season of their life? That happens a lot of times as our young people head off to college. I hate, I hate that we use that as an excuse for some reason. Well, hey, it's just going to happen. But that happens a lot. Where their faith cools off for a season of their life. Are they lost forever? Do they have no hope of redemption whatsoever? You know, every Christian has times where they backslide into sin. Backsliding is kind of this old churchy term that talks about falling back into old sinful habits. Technically, we've all done this, okay? We've all done this as Christians. Anytime we sin, we're backsliding. But that doesn't mean you're not saved. And it doesn't mean that you've abandoned Jesus. Even even some of the most well-known believers in Scripture backslid into old sinful habits. Some of them very serious. And some of them did this for long periods of their life. In the Old Testament, King David committed adultery and then committed murder to try to cover up the pregnancy that resulted from the affair. And he held this lie for almost a, a whole year of his life until God told the prophet Nathan, confront him about this. Abraham, who's often held up in Scripture as an example of a persevering faith, in one situation he doubted God's protection so much that when he and his wife Sarah were traveling through Egypt and they came upon Pharaoh, Abraham was so scared he was going to be killed because Sarah was an attractive woman and he would take her to be one of his concubines. He told Pharaoh, oh, she's my sister, she's not my wife, you can marry her to save his own skin. In the New Testament, Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times in the span of one evening just to avoid being arrested. One of Paul's traveling companions, John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, abandoned Paul and abandoned his calling on the mission field because it got difficult, it got dangerous, so he jetted. But the thing is, every single one of these believers came to repentance, they were restored, and they ended up doing great things for the kingdom of God. A faith that perseveres to the end is not perfection. (laughs) Don't mistake that. A faith that perseveres to the end is not perfection. As a believer, you will struggle with sin the rest of your life. That is a fact. But a faith that perseveres to the end is one in which the overall course of our life is heavenward. A faith that perseveres to the end is one in which the desire, the the greatest desire of our life is for God to continually renew our hearts so that we are more like His Son. It's not perfect. We will fail. We will fall. But we get back up And we keep walking in the direction of Jesus Christ. But the question still remains. Is there a point of no return? In several places in Scripture, it talks about, describes, saying no to God. Or willfully disobeying God so deliberately and so consistently in our lives that eventually God says, 
have it your way. It describes that the Holy Spirit no longer contends with us anymore. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talked about this sin. He called it blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And he said that this sin is a sin in which you will find no forgiveness for in this life or in the age to come or in eternity. So, should you be walking around in constant fear? Constant fear and doubt. Have I done this? Have I committed this unforgivable sin? Let me ease your mind a little bit. If you are worried if you committed this unforgivable sin, you have not. Okay? If you're worried about it, you haven't done it. If, you've re- if, if you're worried that you've committed this, uh, you know, again, the fact that you are concerned about it is proof you have not reached this point in your life. If you had reached this point in your life, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't care what God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit says about anything. In fact, your life would probably look like that you would publicly and verbally be disowning God and ridiculing Him and mocking Him. If you feel conviction in your life when you have sinned and you feel that conviction, I've got to repent, I've got to come back to Christ, you have not committed the unforgivable sin. God will always receive you. He will not cast out for any reason those who come to Him in genuine repentance. And as Christians, we should never give up on those for whom we're praying. Never. Only God can know for certain when a person has reached the point of no return in their life. We can't know that. We can't see their heart. We can't see their soul. What you and I can know for sure is that the Bible is full of people who it looked like to everybody else they were beyond all hope. But they weren't. They weren't. The purpose of these warnings in Scripture that we've read is not to to help us as Christians figure out who's past the point of no return and who's not. That's not the point of it at all. The point of these warnings in Scripture is so we feel the urgency of the situation. We feel the urgency and so we pray for them more passionately. We pray for them more consistently. We try to reach them with everything that's in us. That's what it's there for. Until a person is dead, we have the responsibility to pray for them and try to reach them. And until a person is dead, they have the opportunity to repent and come to Jesus. Once you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're baptized into His name, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, your salvation is secure because of not what we've done, but because of what Jesus accomplished for us. If you're striving to follow Him faithfully in your life, then questioning your salvation is not healthy. Okay? It's not a sign of humility to constantly be questioning our salvation if we're following Him faithfully. I believe it actually shows a lack of trust in God's ability to forgive us our sins. If you trust in the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross, and you're always willing and ready to repent, that when you fail and you fall and you sin, you feel that conviction and you want to come back to God, you can be secure. You should have assurance of your salvation. But I will say this. As a Christian, if you are knowingly and deliberately sinning in your life, you know the Word of God says this, I'm choosing to do that. If we are knowingly and deliberately doing that, we're playing with fire. Because we are actively, if we're living that way, we are actively hardening our hearts and we're hardening our conscience. And we are on a dangerous path towards what Jesus and the author of Hebrews was trying to warn us about. So I say this with all the love in my heart. If that's where you are in your life right now, repent. Stop sinning. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but if you know you're not following the will of God, stop. 
Repent. Change your life. Come back to Jesus. He's waiting for you. I love the words of the song we're going to close with this morning. I'm going to just read some of it. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter, like a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above.